Hello and welcome to Sounds Heal Podcast. I am your host, Natalie Brown, and thank you for joining me once again as we dive into the fields of sound healing, sound therapy, and using sound for health and wellness. I'm excited today to have John Beaulieu as our guest. Dr. Beaulieu is one of the foremost philosophers and major innovators in the area of sound healing therapies, uh, specifically tuning forks. He's a world-renowned speaker, composer, pianist, and also a naturopathic doctor and clinical psychologist. His book, Human Tuning, Sound Healing with Tuning Forks, is a groundbreaking book in the field. And his new book, Sound Healing and Values Visualization, Creating a Life of Value, emphasizes the role of consciousness and self-awareness in creating therapeutic effects of sound healing practices. What I really enjoy about this interview is that Dr. Beaulieu's personality comes across. I was lucky enough to attend a workshop of his in September of 2018, and that was specifically about sound healing and cranial sacral therapy. I was just thrilled by his wealth of knowledge and all that he shared, all his research and what he expressed was so Im- inspirational. But also he easily joked. He has a great sense of humor. He keeps things light when uh, the material can get very serious. And so I'm just glad that was able to come across and you can hear him laughing at himself at times. So please enjoy this podcast with Dr. John Beaulieu. Well, good. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking your time to, to talk this morning. You're welcome. My pleasure. And, you know, for for years, I, I think I was saying your last name incorrectly, Beaulieu, but when I heard you speak in California last year, did you say Bolio? No, it's Bolio. It is Bolio. Oh, good. Yeah, I've been Beaulieu, saying yeah. it right. I've, you know, I think I've heard it wrong. Or um, well, sometimes I joke about it because there's all kinds. You know, there's a oh, maybe that's... pronunciation, <laughs> or a Canadian pronunciation, or French pronunciation. I yeah. Say okay. Beaulieu. <laughs> okay, Bolio. Um, before we get into your your sound healing therapy philosophies and innovations, why don't we actually go back a bit to your sound progression, which which got you to where you are, um, and maybe some highlights from your childhood, whether they're musical or just influential um, moments relating to, to sound that, that you can recall that still stick with you. Yes, I've actually written about some of them uh, mm-hmm. But one of my main ones, I mean, I started playing the piano very early, um, and because my, you know, I, I was, I grew up in Indiana. We had an old, you know, grand piano, um, I would upright piano, grand upright, and uh, I found it, and I just started playing it. Uh, I just loved to play and listen to the sounds, and I would spend hours just traveling the sounds. Um, and my aunt was a uh, graduate in Chicago Music Conservatory and my everybody wanted me to have lessons and she discouraged it uh, until I was nine or ten, somewhere in there. She said, just let him travel on the sound, you know, uh, let him just make things up. And uh, that's what I did. I spent hours making up stories and relating to sounds in that way. Um, and my other favorite story is when I was five, I was, my parents, you know, in those days, going to church for my parents was more of a, you know, you, you went to church because it was a social thing. You went mm-hmm. like on Easter or something like that, and they'd always drag me to church, which I hated, and uh, they put me in Sunday school. And I got so mad in Sunday school, I ran head first to the side of the channel and it made a big sound. Mm. And I remember I, got a, I fell down on the ground and listened to the sound, and I said, I heard the sound of angels, you know. <laughs> so... <laughs> But I was always from the boys playing the piano from a very early age and always exploring sounds and music. Uh, and that's basically, you know, and in fact, when I was uh, nine, uh, actually by the time I was 11, my parents didn't have any money. So 
they didn't, the, the piano was gone. I actually got a paper route and, and earned money to pay for my own piano. And I actually earned the money to pay for my own piano lessons. Uh, and, you know, so that's how bad I wanted it, you know. And yeah, in your, your book, I think Human Tuning is where you talk about a lot of your, your early experiences uh, being an auctioneer um, and your various experiences with sound. Well, with human tuning, now you've got to figure this is, you know, from childhood, this is, you know, 20 years later or something. I basically have got out of college. I'm at Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital. I'm working actually for New York University at Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital to do research and also on community transition and uh, a whole form of counseling for patients. And I'm looking into what's the, the preliminary is what we call post-traumatic stress with rats and things. And I had... Uh, a laboratory at NYU that I would do work with rats and mice. And in that laboratory, in the corner was an anechoic, a small anechoic chamber, which means a room of total silence. And it was put there, I I didn't know this until later, but it was put there by the CIA in the 1950s Mm. to do experiments on deprivation and interrogation. Uh, God only knows, you know, they're they're probably giving people LSD in there as far as I know. Mm Uh, but it was just sitting there. No, it had been abandoned, you know, since probably 1958, uh, and I was there in 1973, so it was all mine to use. Uh, and so I had studied, you know, went to New York also to study avant-garde music with John Cage and so on, and he told stories about being in the anechoic chamber uh, and hearing the sounds in his body, and I immediately said, I'm going to do this, and I went and sat in the chamber, um, and just started listening. And the first thing I became aware of is by heart beating, all kinds of sounds. And eventually, I discovered a high pitch sound that really the sound of my nervous system functioning. And I became very interested in listening to that, meditating on it, and, and basically keeping journals about how it would change and things like that. So that began more my, I guess, my scientific uh understanding of how sound affects the body and the mind like that. And you began to correlate different states of consciousness with different sounds in your nervous well, system. Is that right? I did. Actually, I, I would, you know, the main thing that happened was that I got in an argument. First of all, I'm not a New Yorker by Nate, a native New Yorker, so I'm not used mm-hmm. to fighting with people. You know, I mean, New Yorkers <laughs> love to fight with people. Um, you know, and, and argue and insult people. I, and so I was at the subway booth, and the woman would give me my token. She was just pissed off. She wasn't pissed off at me. She was just pissed off, period. And so she was being not nice, and I had to fight with her to get my subway token because I was afraid I missed the train. It was really upsetting to me, and I didn't even realize until I got to the, I went to the anechoic chamber, and when I went in and sat down, my nervous system was so loud and, and, and just screeching. And I felt the tension in my body in that silence. And I and, and the shocking thing to me was I would not have even had known it had that kind of effect to me had I not had the, the contrast between the, the darkness and silence of the anechoic chamber to measure it against. Um, so I was really like amazed at, at how powerful this one event was in terms of both how I was perceiving the world, but also how it was affecting my body. Um, and that was a wake-up call for me. Um, and I was so upset uh, that you know I was I basically had this insight. I don't know how to explain it. It's like a download we'd say today. Uh, it just came to me that I could. I, I was like a string, and I could tune myself. So I ran downstairs, and nice thing about New York City, there's what you need is everywhere usually. So there's a music store right there, not far from NYU, my lab. Uh, I went to the music store, and because of my studies in music with a composer named Aini Sanakis, who was a mathematical Greek composer, uh, I had learned all sorts of mathematics about sound and I knew about intervals and ratios. The, and, and I studied the mysticism already of, uh, of what we call C and G. Um, and I said, that's it. I want that, you know, I want that ratio. Uh, I don't know why. I, I kind of know why intellectually, but then I just know I want it. So I got it. 
I ran back upstairs. I tapped the two tuning forks, and immediately my nervous system went from screeching, and it entrained exactly to the, the sound of the tuning forks, the ratio, and I felt a wave come over me. It's hard to explain, but a wave uh, that was timeless, I would say. Um, and that's basically was when I'd say the doorway that opened to my work that I do today. That really was um, a door, uh, literally a doorway opened. Um, and I spent the last 40 some odd years uh, uh, documenting that doorway and, and, and as many levels as possible and sharing it and so on. Do many of your protocols, uh, for example, uh, grief or calmness, um, quality sleep, do those come from just, you know, hundreds of uh, clients that you worked with trying different inter intervals, or how did that, that first come about? Well, it comes about in several ways. You know, the first way is something that's kind of lost in science. We call it phenomenological research. So I would spend hours experimenting with different intervals, both in the anechoic chamber and with myself. In other words, I had, in those days, we had a tuning uh, a headphone. It was called the bone phone, mm -hmm. and I could actually wear it underneath my clothes and walk around all day in an interval without anybody knowing it but me. Mm -hmm. um, so I would spend a week in an interval with CMG, an interval with fifth, a week in a third, a week in a fourth. And I also was trained, you know, to do dreams. I was trained as a Jungian analyst, so I was very much into documenting dreams. So I would also have those intervals going all night with speakers by my bedside. So 24 hours a day, I'd immerse myself in a particular interval, and I would start recording how it changed my life, what I noticed, what was different, things like that. I kept journals. Um, you know, so that was my first, you know, way of, of dealing, you know, of investigating it. And then I began to look at the relationship of those numbers to uh, geometric forms. That's uh, today we call that cymatics. I came across cymatics like in 1975, uh, but I began also to look at the, the shape of the body, how the body was structured, the relationship of uh, spiral spiral forms within the body. I became exposed to the work of Rudolf Steiner and people like that, probably in the in the mid 70s. Uh, and it all began to come together uh, intellectually. And then I think as I worked with patients, I began to notice more. Um, I would give them different intervals based on my direct experience, based on my knowledge of the, of the Steiner work, based on my knowledge of, of mysticism, mantras, and so on, uh, to find out what happened. Um, and so I began to correlate that basically, through direct clinical experience. Um, and then in 2002, I wanted to have a little more rigorous understanding. Um, so we went back into the laboratory. That's where we did the, the research on sound and how it affects different molecules in the body. Um, and that's the, my work with nitric oxide, anandamide, um, and eventually dopamine and different molecules we call molecules of ecstasy so tuning forks do spike nitric oxide is is what you found why why is that important well nitric oxide is a, a molecule that's it's a gas that's released by in the body by endothelial tissue the, the linings of your blood vessels heart cells it's released by nerve tissue which is very important neurons and it's released by immune cells and it's a vasodilator it's also something that signals lots of other good molecules to come, especially for anti-inflammatory, painkilling type molecules and so on. Um, and it creates ultimately what we call the relaxation response. This was uh, a, a word coined by Herbert Benson. Um, but the relaxation response, I think, is fundamental to all healing response. So... Uh, when nitric oxide is present, uh, it's antibacterial, antiviral, anti-tumor. Uh, it's something, it's your body 24 hours a day cleansing itself through what we call the rise and fall of this nitric oxide gas, which, which basically uh, stimulates cells to detoxify, and it also stimulates energy to burn in order to, when, when you get to relaxation response, the cells relax. Their toxins go into or eat up by the lymphatic system, 
you know, and so on. And then you get more energy because now you have newer things to burn in the cells. And so and it keeps going like this. And when that process is interrupted, it becomes basically the precursor of every disease you could think of, uh, including, you know, um, autoimmune diseases, neuronal diseases, um, heart disease, uh, sexual dysfunction, colon dys- uh, dysfunction, uh, microbial dysfunctions, um, depression. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on. It's, it's, being, it's fundamental to almost every medical, medical category that exists. Uh, it has to be there. It has to be functioning correctly and rhythmically. So we found that in a way, this was a form of preventative medicine uh, because what stops this, you know, what interferes with the ryth- rhythm and the release of this molecule correctly, you know, is what we would call distress. We can't handle certain parts of our life, so therefore we, t- like, a, like my experience in the, with the subway booth person, I had literally constricted my body to a point I didn't even know it. And then you think over a period of five years, if I hadn't addressed that, if I didn't know it. Mm something's going to break down sooner or later. Mm -hmm. For someone maybe just getting interested in tuning forks and not knowing what to get, I've heard you say that, you know, just the perfect tool that you're going to slip in your pocket or maybe take wherever you go would be the C and G tuning forks. And if you have more room, the 128 weighted fork, the auto um, why those three forks? What would what's great just to have well, as a starter kit? Well, they're fundamental. Yeah, those three forks are really, in a way, the same. They're really just two forks in a way, but they're it's the delivery mechanism. So we have C and G, which is uh, I'm interested in the relationship. The word consciousness really means relationship with. So our relationship C and G is a sonic relationship that we will become aware of it. It really is a relationship that's been around. It's timeless. Uh, we call it C and G to make it easier for people to understand, but it's really a mathematical relationship. Uh, the nice thing about tuning forks is we can take complex mathematics and make it into sound for intuitives, so you don't have to really think math. You get the direct, we call it the direct qualitative experience that's been quantified. <laughs> so now when you listen to that, uh, like I say, that's going to create this relaxation response. Uh, and then the question becomes, how how do you want to deal with that response? I mean, you could do it by tapping forks together. You can, you can tap them on your knees and bring them directly to your ears. Or you could take the third fork, which we call an auto fork, which has weights on it because it vibrates the stem. So you can press it to your, directly to your body to get a strong vibration. And that would be for acupuncture points, trigger points, reflex points. So now you're basically taking the C and G relationship in different forms and you're introducing it into your system in ways that are uh, appropriate, you know, for uh, the person you're working with or for yourself. Why the perfect fifth? Well, the perfect fifth is what we know will create the relaxation response mm-hmm. and also still the 128. Uh, it also, mystically, the perfect fifth uh, was called the uh, perfect dance of Shiva and Shakti. Mm-hmm. It's also in in in, uh, in in Dallas literature, the perfect fifth is the perfect balance of yin and yang. It's it's an it's a relationship that's 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 been around and understood and used for thousands of years. Um, and in my latest book, I wrote 35 pages just on the perfect fifth and its origin, what it means, how it comes, you know, uh, it's science, uh, it's mysticism. Uh, in other words, I think it's just fundamental. It's what actually perfect fifth is what we tune pianos with, it's what we tune instruments with. Um, uh, it, it's so pervasive, uh, in the sound field that it really is like the, the, the fundamental relationship of that we need for consciousness, you know, for changing consciousness, for changing our mind and so on. Um, and like I say, again, from a, from a modern perspective, we could look at it biochemically, what it does in the body. Uh, those to me are just markers of where the consciousness is, is traveling when it goes into this relationship. In other words, when you tap it, you're, 
you're really entering a sacred relationship. Right. I think, you know, along with your, your protocols, uh, especially in your, your latest book, you bring together the importance of both this, the ratios, the scientific aspects, but also the intuitive um, and intentional side of, of healing. And you do that through talking about visualization and feeling tones. Could you talk a yes. little bit about aligning the alignment of our body to specific feeling tones and what that means? Well, well, first of all, we just have to realize that we are vibrational beings. I mean, we're, we're beings who are simultaneously have a physical form, and we also have a wave form. Uh, Western medicine, um, which I'm part of, by the way, and I, I, I like Western medicine, uh, it, everything has its limitation. The limitation of Western medicine is that it looks at physical form and wants to quantify it, but it, re, what it, what it leaves out what I call the qualitative, that is the wave. Uh, other cultures, for example, have been very involved in the wave form um, for dreaming and things like that. Jungians, uh, psycho, when I, with, I, as a Jungian analyst, I certainly am interested in the wave form of dreams and what they mean to people. Uh, when we listen to people's subjective stories, how they perceive the world, it's how they're perceiving the waves that are moving through them, uh, their understanding, their relationship with that. Whereas one of the problems I think we have in modern medicine is this concept of uh, we've seen a lot of opiate addiction and things like that because these drugs have been prescribed for pain. And there's such a lack of understanding of our relationship with pain. And so you go and if one side of the coin says, hey, wait a minute, pain, you know, you know, you have pain, uh, we need to give you something for it. But maybe the person, if you really listen, if you listen to their story, they don't have really have physical pain, they have emotional and mental pain. And the moment you go into that, you go into one of the subjective life, you go into the qualitative parts of their life, and which are not easily quantifiable. You know, so sound, as you, and especially the twin forks, have this unique ability really to, to pull together this, if one listens with the right intention, you can go into one's subjective life, to one's qualitative life, you can discover you know, an intention that is good for them, that they really need, and the sound itself will carry that intention um, deep, uh, literally, to the core of their system uh, anatomically. We, in the core of their system, we call the third ventricle in the brain, uh, but when you listen mindfully, that's where this pattern of the sound will carry that intention into um, we, we say the cerebral spinal fluid of your body will potentize it like a homeopathic remedy. And all of a sudden, as the vibrational pattern changes, so is your relationship with pain, with everything around you begins to change. Uh, that's why even this, for the science, for example, we look at the science of nitric oxide. We also look at the science of non-divide, which is an androgynous painkillers that your body makes. When you're in the right relationship and act with the right intention, you no longer need to have external painkiller. You will immediately discover, you know, in right relationship, what it is that you need to do. The pain will go away. Um, you know, it's different when you have to face something versus let me give you a pill to stop your pain uh, that you've somaticized. Because there's a big difference between somebody gets cut and there's tissue pain and emotional and mental pain. And sound, by the way, has this ability to really deal with emotional and mental pain uh, with the right intention. So the whole point of my new book is really is how does one come to the right intention? Uh, because feeling tones basically are just tones. Literally, we're wave beings. So every time we visualize something, what we're really wanting is the vibration of that something we're visualizing. We want vibration. We eat, we feed, we, we move through a vibratory universe. 
we we quantify it as I want a car or I want this or I want that. But you can have all the cars you want, but eventually they're going to disappear. But what do you really want? What does the car represent? What is it a metaphor of underneath? You know. So then we've learned to look at the vibratory quality of what we want and to let that move through us. That's called a feeling tone. And we can really allow ourselves to discover new neural pathways than what we have been so used to. Um, well, yes, the moment that you, you do that, in other words, like if I say I want this car, that's just uh, a metaphor for what I really want. And the moment I want it, the moment I visualize it, the moment I, I, I pretend I'm in it, I have it, I have the feeling of being in it. The feeling is a vibration. That vibration is like a tuning fork tone. You know, you have it. You actually have the vibration of what you want. You just don't have the particular form exactly that you thought it should come in. Uh, you know, and that's the basis of, of what I call values visualization. Um, you know, because when we look at our modern world, we, we see something on TV. We say, gosh, I want that. But I, I get the example of one of my favorite, my, one of my friends from Indiana, wanted, he went out and bought a Harley motorcycle. Mm-hmm. And I said, why'd you buy that? He said, well, he, he bought it because he wanted the feeling of being 18 years old and riding a motorcycle, really. Um, and I said, where have you gone on it? He said, nowhere. It's just in my garage. I'd like to look at it. <laughs> and I said, you know, I said, that's Midwestern Harley meditation. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. It's all he does. He, he, I asked him, you know, I said, how long, how many hours put in? He said, you've been 100 miles in two years. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if he feels bad or something like that, if he starts feeling old, he says he goes out and looks at it, he feels better. Sure. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's the feeling tone. I said, you right. know, like, you know, it comes in, in other words, meditation comes and mantras come in all different forms. Uh, you know, and, you know, so we look and we say, guys, if we have value judgments around Harley motorcycles or whatever, uh, you, you, you couldn't really get the essence of what he's getting from the Harley motorcycle. It, it, in a way it paced his reality. It was something he felt safe with. Uh, and he was able, he can go in his garage and sit there. He said, actually, he said he goes in his garage. And he has a seat, a, a, a lawn chair. He sits and looks at his motorcycle <laughs> when he feels bad. I mean, <laughs> Work, it works for him. That's great. It works yeah, for and him. of course. And then the question <laughs> I ask him: What are you saying to yourself just before you sit down? In other words, that's your intention mm-hmm. to be with the sound, the feeling tone that you get from the motorcycle. Mm-hmm. And I help them refine that. And why I said I told him I said my tuning forks are less expensive than your yep. Harley. <laughs> <laughs> yep, save a little money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, got you know, it really um, is happening all the time, and uh, can be helpful if we can tune in for you know. And you book in your book, you talk about feeling tones um, and visualizations for dependencies for health challenges. Uh, for yes. bringing in success, um, but really, yeah, it could be uh, found anywhere in our life already with what we're doing. Absolutely, we're doing it already all the time. Mm-hmm. Like I said, we're just my friend the Harley. I mean, he got a Harley for the tone of the Harley, the feeling tone of the Harley. You know, you know, it's hell. You go into the Harley shop now; they, they hear the motorcycles. They say now it's the sound of your soul. That's what they call the Harley. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, but that advertising, you know, they want you to buy a tone. That's what they're asking you to do is to buy a feeling tone, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you know, and if you have this, your life will get better. And there's a suggestion, you know. So, uh, I mean, I had a patient that came in, had all these symptoms. I said, oh, my gosh, what's going on? I said, let me see what you're taking. He was taking a drug that he didn't need. I said, what are you taking this drug for? He said, well, I saw all the happy people on TV, so I asked my doctor and he gave it to me. Oh, jeez. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he thought he'd get that tone from the drug. Right, right. Um, you know, so it's, 
So a whole, if a whole world is vibratory, everything in the universe is vibratory, everything we relate to is done on vibrational basis. Uh, it's just a matter of seeing through the form to the vibrational wave that gives rise to it. In science, we call that actually quantum gravity collapse. Uh, you know, one, one can begin to navigate through tones. Mm. And and why this is important in a bigger picture is it can it can just shift how we feel, how we operate, how we get stuck in negative loops. You know. Yes. Yeah. 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 We get caught in loops. Mm -hmm. uh, we get addicted. You know, we right. uh, an addiction is a loop on different levels. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so we get and, and we, we can have something. You know, all addictions are great. I mean, I'm, I mean, people are addicted because they get something good from it. You know. Uh, you know, so, but they have in their mind that the, in other words, now my friend could get addicted to his Harley. You know, in other words, now he says the only way I can get this tone is through sitting in my lawn chair looking at my Harley. And now, if somebody came in and stole his Harley, he'd be in trouble, you see. Right? Um, you know, he could, you know, he could have withdrawal symptoms even and so on. Because it looked like he could never have that back, you know. Um, and so we hang on to things. Uh, we hang on to something. We create neural network patterns that we loop in. Um, and the idea is that we don't want to get rid of those patterns. We just want to have the ability to travel in and out of them effortlessly. Right. Now, another topic that I've heard come up quite a bit just in general in holistic medicine and sound healing is talk about the vagus nerve. Uh, why is that important and why... Does it maybe it's just because I'm in the field, but I just see people yeah. bringing it up all the time. I know it's a big topic now that we call the polyvagal system, mm -hmm. uh, but basically everything to me is just a marker for you know how we relate to vibration. And the vagus nerve is a very very it's one of the cranial nerves. It's very old. It goes from the head clear down to the gut, it, and it, and it it could you could look upon it as a, a string that's vibrating. And it connects your brain, your, your 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 brain, your heart, and your gut. Uh, and basically, it's with the heart being the middle part, the place the place that balances. So, and the vagal nerve of the polyvagal system is considered your social nervous system. That means that if you say watch the news on TV and get upset, you know. You may not even know you're upset, but if you were to be able to actually measure the vibration of your nerve as you would a string, you'd be out of tune. Um, and so in medicine, for example, they make vagal nerve stimulators, uh, VNS devices, that they implant. And originally it was done primarily for epilepsy. Um, and then now, over a period of a number of years of implanting these, they use them for most for depression, for arthritis. In other words, they keep thinking of new ways to use and tune the vagus nerve through uh, through, through electrical stimulation. Um, and so, what we look at in, in the core natural healing arts, and especially with the tuning forks, is can we preempt that? Can we get uh, allow someone to come back to a tuned state? Uh, through a practice with sound, for example, versus through the implantation of a device surgically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, and when you know when you are in tune, I'd like to say when you're in tune, you begin to experience the world of what it looks like through the neural networks of tuning, of being in tune. Now, the idea of the, oh, what if I go out of tune? Well, I think that's this as important as being in tune, because when you go out of tune, it's fun. <laughs> you can say, I'd like to say everybody has to party and have a good time. That's what life is about. But the problem is when you go out of tune and you don't know how to get back in tune. Mm -hmm. For example, in the subway booth, I went out of tune. Mm -hmm. I had no idea I was out of tune, and I had no idea how to get back in tune. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, so, and that's what happens. People will do something that upsets them, they get out of tune, they don't know it, they have no way to deal with it, and over a period of time, they're looping, 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 they make up values, they make up all kinds of things based on a frequency 
that they can't get out of, and they begin to dissent it even. Uh, you know, and then over a period of time, that takes its toll on the physical body. Um, and you see, eventually, we'd say that frequency becomes more and more somaticized. The body can't function correctly, and then you start seeing the rise of disease. Um, so sound becomes. When, when I use like CNG tuning forks, I tell people, everybody, I want this to be a practice. Now, if you're practicing yoga, you're practicing meditation, tai chi. And you're doing this on a regular basis. In a way, I don't think you particularly need the tuning forks. It's uh, you have a, a, a regular practice where you begin to listen, be still inside, you know, and so on. And the main point is that these practices have to be done on a regular basis, like every day. Um, and what I found in my practice is that. I had a lot, especially in the beginning, they had a lot of blue collar workers and a lot of people, they said the word meditation, they would go nuts. They said the word yoga back then, they'd probably shoot you. Uh, you know, so I said, just take this CNG tuning fork. I want you to tap it on your knees and listen to it before you go to sleep. And when you wake up, I sometimes give them an affirmation or a good intention or just say, just think good things. And do this for me one minute in the morning, one minute at night. That's all I want. And I want it done on a regular basis. That's a practice. Uh, and sure enough, I begin seeing unbelievable results from all my patients, just from having a consistent practice. And they would do it. Um, whereas before, if I tell them I want you to meditate for 10 minutes every day, and they didn't do it, then they start getting depressed because it means they failed at something. So I want them to, to succeed. Uh, and and be regular and have to do it for a, you know for a whole month. They say yes, I did it. I did it. I did it. It's amazing. They start to feel successful. They start to feel better. Uh, they begin to notice things. They begin to start asking me questions uh, they never would have asked before. Well, maybe having a regular practice is is part of your answer to this next question. But in your new book, you express that sound healing is a special field of study and practice that integrate scientific disciplines with one's intuition and creative inspiration. And as sound healing is blossoming, booming field right now, for people just diving into sound healing, what do you encourage them to do, to look into, and to explore both on the scientific and intuitive sides? Well, I think that, again, that's a lot of people now are like, you're going to sound fast. That's uh very popular thing and I think it's kind of like you know you you have an experience and you want to also you know you you begin to like my patients begin once they were doing the C's G's they begin to ask questions you know and then my job basically is is to provide answers to those questions that would honor intuition creativity and also honor quantifiable science, and because uh, the word science means to know, so it, to be clear, to know. So science makes clarity to our intuition, and that's why, for example, I've done the research I've done. I've written with uh, uh, with, with David Martinez. He's a psychiatrist. Uh, he wrote the foreword to my my last book, but we've written together a chapter on sound healing theory and practice for clinical practitioners, physicians, and so on, with extreme scientific documentation. Um, you know, and we want to bring this work into the mainstream uh, in a way that people could find it and say, well, here's the science, here's the practice, you know, here's some, here's people who have ethics, here's people who have only one thing in mind, which is basically to present this at the highest level possible. Uh, and I like to say, in that sense, cream rises to the top. Uh, so you can, the sound healing field, in, in a way, is wide open. Um, I, I can't speak for certain people. Uh, you know, it's you. You have to, in a way, find your way through. Um, now. I like this. I wanted to let you know I like this because I never, 
I'm 100% against, I don't like regulation. I don't want to regulate sound healing. You know? <laughs> I, I, I have no desire to regulate sound healing. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to make it magic. I don't want to make it, it heals everything, that kind of thing. I just want it to be something that's that's available, documented. It has the science to explain what's going on. You can you can have the freedom to argue with it, absorb it, whatever you want. It's there for discussion. It's there for documentation and for research. Mm-hmm. Um, I, in my life, uh, in my practice, have seen you know just amazing results when I integrate sound into my work. I, I have to, I actually have never been a sound healer. I never called myself that. I've always integrated sound into my practice of psychotherapy, of naturopathic medicine, acupuncture, and so on. Uh, with, uh, with it just enhances everything that I do. Uh, I've, I've definitely integrated it to my personal life. It's been my guiding, has guided me for my whole life. Um, but again, you know, it's anything can be used for any purpose. So I would say it's sound healing. It's buyer beware. Uh, one should take responsibility, read the literature, um, you know, and combine intuition with good, good uh, science. And I think you're going to have the answer, you know, um, intuition by itself. Um, just because you had a good experience, that doesn't mean that experience is going to be good for everybody, you know, and. You know, you can have many good, in fact, a very good experience, if you're not careful, could become a loop that you go in. Um, and that's that, by the way, is a definite. And if somebody tells you that you had this great experience, you can only get it by following me, mm. then you're really in trouble. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 But sound has been used for thousands of years to make cults, so <laughs> it's nothing mm-hmm. new there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, so just... To use use judgment and discernment. That's uh, right. Because use there's judgment. a lot out there. Yeah. Yeah, and be smart. Just don't think that it's, you know, this is going to cure your cancer. You you got to, you know, if you got cancer, you need to have a good doctor. You need to have a good intuitive. You need to have you know, whatever. You need to have a team of people, you know, that you work with, and the use of sound within the con within the advice and the knowledge and the wisdom of that team can add one heck of a very powerful tool that you would have. Well, with your research, I know you're so involved with different aspects um, of research and what you're learning. What part of your work is most important to you right now and maybe is getting the least amount of tension, uh, both for yourself, maybe you're not having enough time to really dive in, or maybe it's just not getting attention uh, from others right now? Um, I, I don't know. Actually, you know, for me, I'm, I, I am just constantly, I'm always balancing between what I call the, you know, my rational kind of quantifiable work and my intuitive artistic work. Uh, and at the moment I'd say I, and I, I go, I lean back and forth. I kind of like at a balancing board. Mm-hmm. So in, in the last year, I've been really focused more on art uh, and performance and modern art in a way, avant-garde art. And I have a new project. Uh, I call it Hive Stirrings. It's a div- divination project with sound and uh, graphic sound, sonic waves that I drove. And I'm moving towards doing a gallery show. Um, and part of the show is that I take a lot of people are throwing pianos out now. If I go to my transfer station, there's usually at least one piano a week that's thrown mm-hmm. in the dump. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, because people don't want them anymore. They're heavy. They yeah. take up too much space. They want little you know, electric keyboards. So what I'm doing is saving these pianos. I get them, I take them apart, and I, I save the lyre, the part inside that has the strings. And I made them into new instruments so you could play them with uh, hammers and gongs and scrapers and plumies like you would a gong. Uh, they're heavy, but I put them on wheels. So what I'm moving towards and working towards is a gallery concert uh, in which we have at least four lyres where people can just come in and play them. In the evening, though, we do uh, a concert with the lyres and, and the scores and so on. Um, so in a way, I've moved from the research side over to that side. Uh, but simultaneously, uh, I'm writing 
uh, uh, do chapter two chapters actually for for physicians clinicians, one on sound and consciousness uh, and its function in the healing arts, and the other is on sound and color and light. Um, so, but those are very, in a way, we'd say very rigorous uh, ways of looking at the world, whereas my art is more uh, an artistic way of being with it. I think you have, it's too, I have both. They, I've always, if I get too far into art, I, 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 I need my drug of quantifiable rationality. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I become very rational. <laughs> Otherwise, I go off the deep end, which, I mean, anybody that's sat in an anechoic chamber for five hours, six hours straight. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I was just reading an article on one down in Tennessee. They claim you sit in it for more than five minutes, you go crazy. Hmm. <laughs> I used to come out of the anechoic chamber, and I, you know, I had my rats and my mice, and I'd talk with them. <laughs> Hello, how are you? <laughs> And years ago, that movie Altered States came out with William Hurt, and I, I looked at it, and I said, "Oh my God, this is too close to home." Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I, <laughs> I don't recommend anybody do what I did back then. It's right. Just not right. And I didn't, I didn't take drugs or anything. By the way, I, went to, I took zero drugs after. As a child of the '60s, I understand the drugs up until 1970. Mm-hmm. Then I stopped. You know, I basically stopped all drugs because I wanted to be totally clear for my patients. Um, you know, and uh, but I and also I found that the sound has been used for enlightenment and explores and explore all levels of consciousness for thousands of years. Why would one really need to take a lot of drugs to do this? It's just to me, drugs like and books. I mean, I like them by the way for for healing. For example, I'm involved in some of the projects with ayahuasca for for alcoholism and things like that. Mm. Uh, and done in the right way, I think these drugs could open up doorways, but done unconsciously in the wrong way, they just make more loops for people to get caught in. Uh, and sound sound can take you to places that, you know, that make ayahuasca look like a, a trip to the laundry. You know? yeah. <laughs> so. mm. And it, it just seems like this this balance for you of the artistic side and the science and the research is what keeps you passionate about it's all my, this. it's totally my passion i i i think uh, and my classes you know as you know i i i i i've taken the tuning forks which are extremely mathematical and i've made it the sound available at that level of quantifiable uh, information and to direct experiences that the intuitives can have. Uh, and I, I, I talk a lot about the science of intuition, which is really just amazing. Uh, you know, I, I find it unbelievable that I went through, you know, that I have two doctor degrees and the word intuition was always used as something bad. You know? mm-hmm. uh, uh, with the science is totally antithetical to the science that's out there. So it's really a matter of how do we learn to bring light to intuition in order to balance it out with the, with what, what I said, the quantifiable, the rational. Um, and the problem we have is that intuition has been pushed so far into the shadows that you have intuitives that they, they get an answer and they think it's the right answer. Oh, this is it. I got it. So it has to be true. Um, and that's the problem. Um, it, I mean, you know, I, I always get the example of Einstein who, Basically, he was playing his violin. He was writing light waves of, on sound when he discovered the theory of relativity. But he had only well, discovered he was if he did all his work in physics to make the discovery. Uh, you know, so intuition needs this balance with science or with with some kind of quantifiable thinking, uh, and then then you have something. Uh, you know that that to me is is what I'm always looking for and that balance point changes obviously you don't want your surgeon you know to you know go off so far intuitively that he forgets what he's cutting i mean no that's ridiculous so the, but that would be different than the balance point that i may use in psychotherapy at different times and so on um so we have to think of it as a as a constant movement back and forth and that different professions different parts of life require 
uh, different balances to use it correctly. And of course, the sound is just, I mean, sound is so easy. If, you, if I do a tuning fork sound bath, people just, I just tell people, go, you know, go off. But you give them the right intention and they go off with that intention. You know, then they bring something back, then they have to figure out how to integrate that into their life in a way that makes sense both intuitively and quantitatively. And I guess you, you've really put that together in your own compositions, you know, bringing, aligning the body and creating relaxation through sound, through these tuning fork baths. But also, you know, they're very um, mathematic, mathematical, the ratios, the biosonic repatterning. Are you are yeah. you still doing compositions and recordings? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, I still record. I, so you realize I do the, the tuning fork sound best, but I also play. I, I, I just, you know, when I go off into my artist, my artist side, I, you know, I do all kinds of crazy avant-garde. I go off into sound all over the place. Uh, I travel in sound. Uh, in fact, my, my recent project is meeting a group of beings in the quantum field that I call the hive, uh, and 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 I make I just have people look at the at the wave drawings, and that's then they have to put it down and make sounds. So the idea is basically when you're aware of something, the field changes, and if you're not bound by traditional music concepts, you begin to just allow the sounds to emerge kind of like what people might call uh, div divination channeling or something like that, but with a little more structure. And I also, you know, I am, besides my work in the, you know, healing arts, I also have a master's degree in piano. So I, I will play from time to time, you know, uh, I don't do whole classical concerts. I play for my wife, I play with Brahms and Chopin and she dances. And I, I, I like that kind of music also. But I approach classical music and playing composers like Scrabin or Mampu, whatever, uh, like working crossword puzzles. <laughs> so as a discipline, I, you know, some people may, I don't know, work crossword puzzles or whatever. I sit down and I learn a piece of music uh, and play it. Uh, that's it. Uh, so I, and I, in and, and my discography, I have. Uh, hours and hours of uh, classical music improvisation that I put up. Uh, actually, one of my pieces has something like 80,000 hits now. Mm, <laughs> For, yeah. You know, I did a whole thing in Debussy and, and uh, the lady with the flaxen hair it seems to be very popular. Mm. But I'm not actually, I'm. what I do is I look at Debussy's music. I like to have his music in front of me and as I'm playing it, I just allow myself to have a conversation with Debussy and then just go off. I go, you know, just let myself go. Uh, and that's the, 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 I begin to improvise. Um, and this, uh, but I have the facility in the years of training to do that in a way that I don't have to think about anything. So those are just part of my art projects that I do. Uh, and of course, then I record all my tuning forks. People come to my studio and they say, oh, my gosh, because they see 3,000 tuning forks all over the walls. <laughs> uh, and they'll say, well, why didn't you market these? I said, because I don't market all of them. I only market a very small number that I, that I work with. <laughs> but, and I decided what I should do is record those tuning forks and, uh, and make it available that way. Uh, so I started recording all kinds of strange um, ratios and math, math that I'm doing with sound and putting that up also for people to listen to. Yeah, what you were describing with the, the piano um, and Debussy just kind of reminds me of your relationship with, with two forks, the C and the G. Like, you know, how does it, how do you relate to it and just putting yourself in that sound, whatever it is in particular, whether it's a C or G or a piece of piano music, it's it's just what it's is true. It? Yeah, yeah. That's true. I'm I have a relationship with Debbie. I like to say I have a relationship with these composers. Mm -hmm. like they don't, whether they're dead or alive is neither here nor there. I have a relationship with them, you know. And when I play their music, I'm in relationship with them, um, you know. And so, and that's kind of how I approach what I call classical music improvisation. Um, but to have that relationship, in a way, 
I can't be bound by the notes per se that they wrote. Uh, those are just gateways. Um, but um, you know, and it's very interesting when I take the, you know when I, if I put somebody in front of a normal piano and say just play, don't just do something. They will always get upset. They will get depressed. They will start trying to play a tune, to play chopsticks. I don't know. They, in other words, they, they, the instrument as a normal piano carries with it all all sorts of things that you that you should be doing, or they have bad memories of piano lessons or right. whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. But if I if I strip the piano to the lyre and there's a bunch of strings that they don't recognize and put them in front and say play, they're all like little children. They start making sounds and going everywhere. Uh, and that's what I want from people. I want them to get past just normal music values and genres and go directly to sound, which is which is really all music is just the way we hear sound. Because music to one person may not be music to another. Uh, and go directly to the sound. And, and when I had the piano liars, just amazing. Just, you see people light up like little children. Uh, you know, and they start... They become musicians, and 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 I say, and I tell them, guys, that's you're a musician. They go, no, we didn't go to school. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we could get rid of that thought. Right. You know? right. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. yeah. And the people that went to school, they, a lot of them have trouble sitting down and doing that. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's true. I know. Yeah. I I played a piano concert in Zurich, and. Uh, of my own music, I go, you know, I get pretty wild stuff. And so the, the lady comes from the Zurich Music Conservatory. She's there. She walks up to me, me afterwards. She says, she says, John, she says, you play like a little child. <laughs> and I said, thank you. It's yeah. taken me my whole life to get to there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the look on her face was like, you're trying to insult me, but it didn't work. Right. I, took, right. I took it as a compliment. Mm-hmm. And I, said, I, I said, could you write that for me? Could you write a review that says that? <laughs> Right, just to have that wonder and uh, yeah, play yeah. playtime. Mm-hmm. The wonder, the traveling, of the sound. I was so happy, like I say, as a child, that music wasn't forced on me. I could just travel in the sound and make up stories, and and that's and all those years of training to play these composers. In the end, I just want to travel on the sounds, you know. And so when I play Debussy, I just I have the relationship to beat him with his music, but I just travel on sound based on you know, what he wrote, you know. Or Scrub, I love Scrub and though. Um, so but that's different. I think I, I also have learned how to play Raga so I, on my harmonica. So right. now with the Raga people come over, I, I just sit, I listen, I travel on the sound. And I, I I'm not trained in Raga, I just fake it. Mm-hmm. I'd like to say I'm a good fake Raga player. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to do. Raga's hard to fake. <laughs> yeah, we're, in the, we're in the realm of fake everything. So. Right, true. Yeah. <laughs> and actually in the piano, you can buy fake books, which is my favorite. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah I, know, I first saw those and go, whoa, look at that. It says literally fake it. You know? Yeah. And it's got 5,000 songs. You can just look at it and fake them. <laughs> Play it the easy way. Nice and simple, right to the point. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, so I could play hundreds of pop tunes. So I can, you know, I just fake it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, most pop tunes are only, you know, a couple chords. So. <laughs> I know. So in a way, in, in a way, we could learn. And the research is. See, I come back to the science. The science is a guy who took. He's. I think it's UCLA. He took jazz musicians who were really improvisers. He put them in an MRI with a keyboard. He made a whole special thing, and it, when they're improvising, it sh- uh, what he what he saw was all the centers in the brain that have to do with self judgment, with you know, with being angry at yourself, evaluating yourself, don't even show up. <laughs> wow. Hmm. You know, they just, they're just traveling on the sound. They're not sitting there, you know, making up rules or judging themselves. Now, part of your your gallery thing that you're going to do, are you going to allow people to just play? Oh yeah, they're going to be. You could go in there 24 hours a day, walk around. The liars going to be available, and the scores are on the wall. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's um, and then in the evening, I invite my my. I mean, I've been Woodstock, so believe me, there's no trouble inviting people over to play. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so we'll have.
have concert, and then some of the evenings I'm going to have 24 concerts, like in you know different ways into the sound, and it's uh, you no. Know, so it's going to be you know that that's. But for me, like I said, the challenge that I have is I always say when I come back into the art world, you got to deal with the art world, you mm-hmm. know. So but there's always politics and these things, and uh, it goes on and on and on. I mean, right. so uh, and. In the past, I've had my, my scores all over the world in galleries, so I know I've been there and I've done that, and I said I wasn't going to go back and do it, but I had such a powerful experience with this hive stirrings and stuff. I said, it's not a matter of me, it's a matter of what I have to do. So I said, that's it. I'll go back in the art world. I'll figure the politics out, get this done. Yeah. Uh, so it's, that's my, the, in a way, my challenge at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, Well, as we wind down here, is there anything else coming up that you're really excited about? Any collaborations or something you're particularly interested in right now? Well, I say I've always my uh, I work with I, I love to collaborate with, uh, with with David Press Martinez. He's a he's a great sound healer, a great psychiatrist, and uh, he has such a great insight into into the work. Uh, it's a, it's in other words, a collaboration is a relationship, and it's inspiring. And I'm also working, of course, always with my wife. She's a dance therapist. Uh, he's also a color therapist, and we're working with Jerry Weintraub. He's an optometrist, and we're doing this whole work with light and color and sound, which is really inspiring. Also, um, and always, you know, when when I teach uh, and do my clinics, I. I my relationship with my students and people that come to me is is what and it, it's like the gas, the fuel that keeps me going because I see and I learn from them, uh, you know, so much. You know, their questions, everything that goes on is just inspiring for me. So I keep teaching. In, in a way, I want to give it away. I do because I'm. I, how long can you know? Can I? My whole thing is to get all of this as much as I can and people inspired. Um, but I certainly have no desire any longer to like make a super brand or that kind of thing. You know, I just, yeah. uh, I, I write all these articles for professional journals, for, for art things and stuff. Just, uh, can I give it away? You know, uh, it's a healing art. It's not, um, I don't want it just dependent on me. I want other people to take it and run with it. It's what I want. And it's what the radio show is about. As far as I'm concerned, people can, from all walks of life can, be introduced to this, enter into it, and then you begin to be responsible for what you you have a relationship with in this field. Yeah, so I, I enjoy coming on the radio show. Yeah, <laughs> I do. <Yeah. coughs> I, I enjoy it as long as I have the time to do it. And, right. And right now is my. Uh, I've decided I'm taking time off from my normal schedule, so it works out really well for me to be able to talk and. I'm sitting in my studio now, and it's raining outside, so I'm not thinking about playing golf. <laughs> right, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so appreciate your time. It's been really nice to to talk with you, and I just, I, I really appreciate your enthusiasm, your both seriousness and humor. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's it's so fun to to hear. Yeah, it's got to it's got to be. And by the way, it has to be fun. I mean, yep. the one thing I'm working with, working with very, very serious conditions, is mm-hmm. you, you can't laugh and have fun. You're going to be, you're going to be depressed real quick. You know? You're right. It's exactly. It's yeah, that. But whole... I like to say, I'm, I'm very playfully serious about what I do. Yes, it's that balance again. It's all about balance. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Um, I really oh, you're welcome. appreciate you and all that you're doing in the sound field and all the related fields. Enjoy, enjoy your, is it, what's it without there, it's raining there now, you said? Actually, the sun is out today, so maybe I can actually get outside, yeah. (laughs) That means, that means it'll be here tomorrow. (laughs) Yes, exactly, so enjoy it tomorrow. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right, have a great day. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining this episode of Sounds Heal Podcast. You can keep up to date with what's coming up next at SoundsHealStudio.com, on Facebook at SoundsHealStudio, 
and YouTube on the Silence Heal Studio channel. You can hear meditations, sound performances, and other podcasts. Be well and stay tuned.